What's up, y'all? This is Chitty Bang, and I'm on the Renegade Millionaire Show, the podcast that profiles entrepreneurs, founders, and CEOs. Join us as we go one-on-one inside the hearts and minds of some of our generation's best and brightest. And now, introducing your host, my friend, Sun Group Wealth Partners Managing Director, CNBC and Forbes.com contributor, Winnie Sun. Hi, everybody, and welcome to the Renegade Millionaire Show. This is Winnie Sun, your host, once again, here in TuneIn Studios here in Venice Beach, California. I am super excited with our guest today, but before we get into that, once again, you know I'm the founder and managing partner of Sun Group Wealth Partners, so I invite you to reach out to see if you have any financial planning needs or questions. You know, I always love to hear from you. And that that note, we're going to lead in with a little bit of financial planning uh, know-how for you. I've been asked a lot lately about how to save for college, especially for children. As you know, I have three kids of my own, six, three, and one. So, you know, I often joke, one of my business partner the other day said, you know, Winnie, you might want to think about getting yourself a new car. And I said, well, you know, that's great and all, except uh, I know you've got a nice car, but at home, I've got myself a Maserati, a Mercedes, and a BMW. <laughs> Because, you know, obviously children do cost a lot. But those of you who are parents, I do encourage you to consider saving for those college expenses. Obviously very helpful as us being parents, but even more meaningful for as our children get older and as they go and start their own careers and make a difference in this world. And with that, I'm super excited to introduce you to Susan Naylor, who is actually the mom of my very good friend, Bruno Naylor, quite a, an accomplished person himself. And one of these days, hopefully we'll get him in front of the mic here. But Susan, his mom, is quite incredible. Um, Bruno and I actually had conversations about this via text and via phone. I said, your mom was the real deal. And he's like, I know. And he's, he was telling me these incredible stories of back in the heyday. But if you ever want to see a son sparkle, when he talks about his mom. I hope my kids do this one day. You've got to meet Bruno and Susan because when he talks about his mom, his eyes just sparkle and light up and it just warms my heart. And I tell you, uh, meeting Susan now, I would say I understand why because she is the real deal. She was what I call the working mom before it was popular to be a working mom. In fact, Susan just shared with me that owning a, uh, I would say a tech data company today, This she owned the data company before there was tech. Uh, Susan, welcome for coming. Oh, thank you, Winnie. Thank, thank you. you so much for joining us. Susan, you were telling us that, you know, having a, a, a data company um, that we would, that is called the Daryl Survey, you were doing business pre fax machines, free pre-copy machines, and pre-cell phones. So I know our audience is just, their jaw is on, on the table. And as a working mom myself, I my hat goes down to you because I can't imagine building such a successful business as you have and juggling family. Yes, and not being able to communicate except for the phones at a hotel or Really, that's all we had were the phones yeah. at the hotel. And um, this wasn't even that long ago. I mean, no. this mm-hmm. was in the, the mid-70s, right? Well, I was, I was traveling in the mid-70s, and then I had my first child when I was, it was in 1981. Mm-hmm. And really, that was the first time that we even had computers was 1981. I mean, computers in a small enough, you know, to go in an office. And when, when I first started, which was in 1974... The woman who I bought my company from, Virginia Darrell, was 70. So, she, and we used to type the reports. We would, first of all, our survey is golf equipment. We go to golf tournaments and we write down what kinds of equipment all the golfers use. Um, years ago, people used to say that we would be a great study for what's my line. Because <laughs> if somebody would have put us on there and said, 
Now, guess this company. They would have mm -hmm. never guessed it. Yes, you're like the biggest company nobody's heard of. Yes. Because the Daryl survey is considered the J.D. Power of the golf business. And, you know, it's really the golf industry's leading independent and impartial arbiter. I'm reading the bio right now. I apologize of equipment, but it's just so huge. Impartial arbiter of equipment use. Um, so you've been called the J.D. Power associates of the golf business business by the best. You've been called this by Callaway's Chuck Yash. And Daryl Survey is a family run business here owned in Los Angeles, owned by Susan yourself and your brother John. Mm -hmm. And your offices are in LA and Atlanta and you carry on the tradition begun by Eddie and Virginia Daryl mm -hmm. in the nineteen thirties. In the past twenty years, Daryl Survey has developed alongside the golf industry modernizing its methods with computer technology and expanding its territories across the globe. That's yes. your bio. That's what I got Thank from the you. website. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Yes, we, well, when we first, when I, when Eddie first started back in the 30s, he was a friend of a, a famous old golfer named Porky Oliver in grade school. And he would go to the tournaments and he would take a starting sheet and he would just write down, Titleist ball, Foot Joy Shoe, Spalding this, Wilt McGregor that. And then he would give that to the manufacturers, and the manufacturers would, you know, pay him a little something so that he could have a hotel room that night. And it, <laughs> and then really, so he invented it. So he would a, calm the room. <laughs> mm -hmm, exactly. So he invented a data company before anybody even knew about data. Yeah, this is before Dropbox. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and so then um, throughout the 60s and then the, the 50s and 60s and then into the 70s, he, he died, um, right, early early 1970s. And then his wife, Virginia, was by herself trying to keep the company going. And so she then asked me to join her. And so it was the two of us. She I was 20. She was 70. And two we, women on the golf course. This is incredible. If you don't know, Daryl Sorry it is. Actually, I learned this through the time. Mm -hmm. So basically, um, Susan or Virginia would go to all these PGA tournaments and basically be snooping around in people's golf bags to see what kind of clubs and even on the sh like all their equipment that they were using, right, that they needed mm -hmm. to report back golf to. Golf balls, irons, woods. Even their shoes? Shoes, uh -huh. hats, bags, gloves. Um, but anyway, they Virginia was a, um, a real character, and and – I learned a lot from her, and she had three little terrier dogs, and we would get in the car. <laughs> this is true. We would do Pebble Beach, which was um, – That's Bing, a big deal, right? Pebble yeah, yeah. That was, that was the um, Bing Crosby tournament. Um, wow, Bing Crosby. Remember? Yeah. And that now it's the AT&T. Um, we would do um, Bob Hope's tournament, which, wow. which is now Humana. But, but anyway, we'd do the West Coast, and then we got in the car. And we drove across the country to – right before the Masters, and then we went to the Masters, and we stayed on the road, these Virginia, me, and three dogs, and never came home until Thanksgiving. Oh, my goodness. So I read that. It's like nine months on the road, right? We, we didn't fly anywhere. Oh, wow. In fact, the players didn't fly. Nobody flew. We all drove. There were planes back then. Well, no, but, but we why? didn't fly. Nobody, hardly anybody flew. Oh. And, and the, the, um, there were maybe 30 tournaments. And we would just go from, like, we might go from Philadelphia down to Texas, and then we might go to Chicago, and then we might go wherever. And we, our job was just to be there by Tuesday. <laughs> we'd have to be there by Tuesday, and then we could leave on Friday or Saturday, and then we'd go to the next tournament. And I did that for five years with Virginia. And, you know, that's driving across the country back and forth. And, um, and again, no fax machines, no cell phones. We had CB radios. Virginia always had a CB radio. And um, we got a new car every year. She had a, usually it would be a Cadillac. Like her, her famous one would be a black Cadillac with red interior. And we had a CB radio. She was the Duchess and I was the little Duchess. And we, <laughs> we had, we'd talk to the truck drivers and go wherever. How fun. No, and we'd go to the AAA. There's no Google Google Maps. Maps, right, right. So you no we, GPS, people. Nothing, nothing. Oh, so wow. we would we would go to AAA and we'd get triptychs for the whole year. We oh, would know where wow. we had to be. We'd flip these books and we'd figure out where we had to go. You were and, truly navigating. Were you a driver? Both of us drove. She drove for the first few years. A little later, she got a little tired, more tired when by the time she was seventy six. But but she um, she was really a trooper at the beginning and 
And one dog was named Killer, Calamity, and Little Pro. They were characters, and, and she was a character. The tour was a character. Anyway, <laughs> and, and then we would, we would do our survey, and then we would have to, if a manufacturer wanted the data right away, we would call them up on the telephone that Thursday night, and we would read off every player's name and every piece of equipment they might want. And then you couldn't send the data. You, we had to put the data in the mail sometimes – and then we had a typist in L.A. help type, or sometimes we would type them in the room. Then we'd make these reports and mail them, and everything would be a week late. I mean, we just have to go by mail. Right, right. But we do a lot by phone. And then, and then, like I said, in 1980, we got a when the copy machines came out and fax machines came out. That must have then been that was great. a big thing for us. Yeah, that was a really big thing, and life changed after that. And you know, then I was, and then Virginia didn't believe in computers still. So then finally, I got computers and. We managed to, um, and then now, obviously, we have a website, and they get their data within three hours after the last oh, tea wow. time. Mm-hmm. It's um, they we send in the we we scan in the data. We we still use paper forms, and people sometimes say, "Why do you do that?" And we say, "Because we want to see the changes. We want to see if we crossed it out and we made the change." Like for example, recently, Titleist, um, well, a couple of years ago, Titleist called and said. We're having a lawsuit with, I think it was with Bridgestone, and they needed to have documentation of when this model was first introduced to the United States. So they asked us to go back to the 1980 Colonial Tournament and see. So I had a wow. I had a loose leaf, we call them, mm-hmm. and it had Joe Ozaki make a new code, and that was the first time that that ball was in the United States. So wow. then they could use that as documentation for a lawsuit so that they could... But but that little paper looks like it's not much, but just having it documented the notes, uh, it's authentic- impactful. Yes, yes, yeah. uh, authenticized the um, the the need that at least the attorneys had. So there's there's a bunch of reasons that our data is important. It's a Titleist will say number one golf ball, or or Taylor made will say number one one driver, or somebody else say number one shoe, and you have to say that we saw that equipment on site. And that's what they were using. You can't just say they used it at the practice round or they said they liked it or they say they're using it. That We're like the independent person saying, they, yes, they saw it. And then the other thing is if they have contracts like with um, Callaway, Titleist, TaylorMade, whatever, and they say you have to use 10 clubs, they can document and say, yes, he used his 10 clubs so that million-dollar, 10 million, whatever contract we're giving them, they lived according to their contracts. So we're the we're – the, um, you're the report card in, to make sure that they're doing what they're supposed the in, to do. The independent observers. Observer, right. Mm-hmm. And a very trusted source, so much that you are such, you've become such an integral part of the golf industry. Mm-hmm. And I read that Arnold Palmer. Arnold Palmer. Arnold Palmer. <laughs> there we go. Who is a, who's a legend in the industry, came by and he saw you standing in the crowd and said, hey, Susie, what you doing here, right? And no, he, no, it was at the Masters. At the Masters, we, back then there wasn't a one ball rule. And you could use a different golf ball. So Virginia would be at, right by the tee, and I would be down by the green, and I put a hat on, and I was I was being incognito, and <laughs> I'm standing on the side of the putting green watching the golf balls. I didn't have to get the model. I just had to get the make to make sure that that was the right make, or the make that agreed with the first tee. Do you sometimes have to get the model as well as the make? Oh, we get every model. We get down to it's a Strix and oh, XV dot. Sense. Wow. Uh, uh, Every model of the irons, we get every model of the shafts. Every, but back then, we didn't do models to that extent. Mm-hmm. It was more just the brand and the general model. Now, sure. just because things are more techy, we do lots more models. But, um, but I remember I was thinking I was incognito, and he leaves the putting green and he comes walking, walking, walking right to my face, and he gives <laughs> me a big kiss on the cheek. Goes, "What, Susie? What are you doing out here?" I said, "Oh, just spectating." <laughs> he said, <laughs> "This lady was standing next to me, and she said." I'm going to stand by you. Is this going to happen again? I said, no, no, there's only one Arnold Palmer. It's not anymore. So, because he's, he's like that all, he's just f- very friendly and very down to earth. I think that's his, his charm. He's just, he's, he's always that way with many, many people. Well, let's talk about that. I mean, we know in different industries, it's difficult being a woman. I mean, being that you and Virginia, or m- mostly let's just talk about you, being female in the golf industry, mm-hmm. are there any challenges? Well, back when, back when I, in 74, they didn't have female, um, I mean, it was before Jane Pauley. 
think about that. It was, mm-hmm. it was, they didn't, ha- and in the golf tour, they didn't have women announcers, let alone, mm-hmm. and there was the men's golf tour. So I remember one of the things when, when sometimes even the wives would look and think, what is she doing out here? It was, Virginia was okay because she was really old, you know, and I wasn't old. So at the beginning, they, they didn't take me seriously, or they would think, oh, this company's going to fall apart, or, oh, she's, she's going to be gone in a minute, you know, and I think they were surprised when, when I, I um, was able to make sure that Virginia had what she needed. Because many, many times, and I even know how I feel sometimes with my, as I get a little bit older, I really appreciate the energy of Bruno or, or my son Anthony or my daughter Anne helped. In fact, my daughter Anne was just in a, in a, a commercial for Titleist. She was the, they wanted to be authentic with the survey. So they said, could you show the survey takers, which were going to be actors, how to, do the survey, and then she would look so good. Yeah, and he's a pretty one. She was very pretty, and they and they said, oh, she well, could she be like in you. it? And she said, could they be in it? She'd be in it. And so she's in the commercial, and they say, what golf ball? And he goes, Pro V1 or whatever. But we could be in another company's commercial, too, because we are totally independent. It's not that right. we favor any one brand. And um, But anyway, that's the energy of my family and the youth really helps me now because the thing that I think – is the magic of your age and the magic of people is is you you get in a certain circumstance and you and magic happens you run into this person and this person runs into that person like you're you're the best at putting people together but you bump into this one and this one and you put them together there was there's one just quick story that I think is 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 really good in 1980 I talk about being a woman in a very very male environment Industry. Mm-hmm. Um, the British opens even more so because you can't, a woman isn't even allowed in the clubhouse. Really? Back in 1980, no. And I went to my first British Open, and I went there by myself. And um, I didn't know about all these rules. And, and I was just going to do this survey, and I met some of the— You're like, I just want to see your bag. <laughs> yeah, no, but you step forward. And that's the big thing that I really encourage people is to have curiosity and to step forward— Take a step, and the minute that you take a step, something interesting might happen. But if you don't take the step, then you can just live in this little box, and your life will probably be fine. But the magic is when you step forward. And like in like this one time, I it was really funny because it, it, I didn't know anything about the British Open, and the golf courses are so different. I wandered around the golf course. This was on a Monday, I think, or Sunday or Monday, and and you can't see the holes. You can't see the flags. It's called Lynx courses. Mm-hmm. And this man was walking, and I said, and he was telling me about it. I said, oh, this is so interesting. He said, oh, would you like to come in the clubhouse? So I'm going to barge in. The, I'm going to walk in the clubhouse. He said, stop, stop. You have to have this special thing that ladies can come in. I'll give you this. I said, really? Women can't come in here? He said, no. So he gave me a special ladies badge. So I walked in, and I sat at a round table like this, kind of by this little bar. And they all were men. And... This one man was sitting there, and he said, you were recently in a golf magazine. And I said, oh, no, I wasn't. And he said, yes, you were. And I said, you know, I don't think I was. And he said, yes, you were. And he was really stern. And I said, okay, I don't know. And so then (laughs) he got up, and he walked in a door. And when he walked in the door, there was this black lab dog. And I I really like animals, so I said, oh, my goodness, that's your dog. That must be your office. He said, yes. He sat down, and there was one page out of Golf Week magazine, Golf World magazine. I'm sorry, there wasn't a golf week back then. Golf World magazine. And there's a picture of me the size of a postage stamp oh, that wow. he had on one piece of paper. Didn't Aww. even have the magazine. I said, what are you doing oh, Right, that this is paper? a little creepy. Isn't that creepy? Yeah. And you know what he said? Read further. The whole p- article was about him. He was Captain Patty Hamner, the meanest man in golf. He was the the head of the whole thing, and he could decide who got on the golf course and who couldn't, and nobody could wow. get on the golf course. And he was the toughest man. And there I was with my picture on his page. Uh-huh. And after that, we became friends. Aww. And I became friends with his dog and his mother and his sister. And the first day of the tournament was pouring down rain. And I wasn't going to, never asked to be on the tee. I stayed to the side. And the first day of the tournament, he took one arm and the other man took another arm. They took me right to the first tee and put me on the first tee and said, This is where you'll be. Incredible. Those are magical steps that happen when you take a step. Like I took a step to go, and then those things happen. And you, barriers get broken. And But what are the odds of your picture being on the same page as this man that had all the power at this tournament? Well, and the man taking me in the room. 
I would have never met him. Yeah. And so that, that's probably an advantage of being female as well. I think right? that isn't it. Yes, yes. Mm -hmm. That was an advantage of being female and of just being open and curious and taking a step. And, and I think that, that that's one thing that I would say to any mothers, that you talk to your kids, you tell them your stories, you learn and acknowledge when something magical happens, and you say, I always say, say, thank you, God. But it's like magical things happen all the time. Not all the time, but if you take the steps and then you share it, and then it can happen again, and or it can happen for the children because they're out on the lookout for it. You know, they're, they're watching. But if, if you don't talk about it, then they don't know. Like, like Winnie, if you have some magical things happening and you share them with your children, then they'll start their day and they'll share their magical things and more magical things will happen. Well, that's incredible that you say that because one of the things um, that really struck a chord with me was hearing the stories about, I mean, you were a working mommy before it was popular and accepted to be a working mommy. So back then, women were expected to stay mostly around the home, mm -hmm. correct? I mean, obviously women worked as well, but not to the extent that they're traveling all across the United no, States no, no. and Japan and everywhere else that you've gone. Um, can you talk a little bit about that? Because I thought that was really profound. And that, that to me, as a working mom, mm -hmm. was very eye-opening about your vision on letting your children experience what you do. Right. I think that especially other mothers, are very critical. The, the PTA mothers, it, it's really good to I be know. a PTA mother. It's really good. But They're so tough. often you go and you know that you can't get a big, make a big, huge commitment because you're working. You're working or you might be there and you might not be there. And so they'll say, well, I care so much about my children that I quit my career or I this or that with my career. Well, some people can have a career and they can come back to it. And other people like me and like you, if you don't create your career, it goes away. Yes. And yes, you can say, well, how much money do you need? Maybe, you know, whatever. But it's not just money. It's also creating and being come, becoming who you are. And, and having a purpose. And having a purpose. So I think now there are way more working mothers. But back then, it was, I was crying all the time. And, and I, and as far as understanding, I'm going to be leaving or I didn't do as many international things back then. So I would only be gone maybe three days at a U.S. Open. I might be gone four or five days, but, or, you know, major tournament. But normally it was just two days. And um, then I'd be home most of the time, you know, because you, you have a little more flexible flexibility. And it isn't perfect. I don't, I'm not going to go down as the mother of the year, you know. I mean, mm -hmm. I don't, didn't make great dinners. I don't dinners think or, anyone exists. There's no mother of the year. <laughs> yeah. Well, well, maybe. Some of the, you know, <laughs> if, if we're born rich now. <laughs> maybe, maybe. I don't know. Right. I don't know. But but to be an example and, and especially have ideas and and I always would say to my kids, you can make your – people say, I can't get a job. I can't this. I can't that. Well, you can make a job or you can think of something different. And it's a good example. When you made a career, I made a career out of something that wasn't there before. Like they can't say it can't be done because you did it. Mm -hmm. So it's good, but but it it's it, it it's terrible. It's a terrible, terrible position to be the mom that that everybody looks at. Like like I I remember my one my oldest son. He said, "Mom, why don't you get one of those books?" His name is Anthony. We're coming back from preschool. We're driving up our street, and he said, "Mom, why don't you get one of those books?" And I pulled the car over, and I said, and he said, "One of those books, like because I really want to listen to him." I said, "One of those books, like those other mothers have that." They go in and then they, they decide they're going to have play dates to go to McDonald's or they're going to – and then we can have one of those books and we can go have play dates and stuff Aww. with these other moms. And I said, okay, Anthony, if we can do some of those play dates, but if I – if I, I really don't have to do this work. I mean I could stop working right now. And any, any time that I want to get you something or whatever, we'll have to go to dad and we'll have to ask him for some money and then he'll let us get things. And I was – he loved gadgets. He had the – best little <laughs> toys in his pockets all the time and little transformers and I said so if we want to get a transformer we'll get dad will help us get this and he sat there and he thought and he said you know it's okay if you work because because he knew that I just would always think of things I'd take him places I'd do fun things and I didn't have to ask anybody anything and um he liked that I think so he, he decided no that's okay you can work yeah and I think kids understand that like this Friday um it's volunteer day for us 
on Friday, this Friday, mm-hmm. with my my kindergartner. And um, he's like, I really want mommy. I said, well, mommy can't be here, be there on Friday because mommy's on CNBC on Friday. And he's like, why does CNBC always want you on volunteer mommy day? <laughs> but it's, it's, you know, but they, it breaks they, your heart. It does. But they, they start to understand. It's exactly, you just have to quantify it. Well, you know, if mommy doesn't work, then we can't da 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 And they, they start to understand. They appreciate the fact that, and I think it's good to have, I, I really believe that our responsibility to our children is for them to see us fulfilled and happy mm-hmm. and being productive citizens of the world, right? Mm-hmm. And them seeing us work hard and being fulfilled and happy and providing for our children, I think says a lot for them as when they grow up, they want to be productive and 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 working and, and contributing to the world, mm-hmm. right? And I see, you know, let's talk about your kids. I mean, um, you have an incredible relationship with your children, and they respect you and they love you, and they're very hardworking and driven people. Mm-hmm. You know, you've done a good job. Well, I, th- I think that you always think, I could have done this or I could have done that, but in general, I think that at least we always talk. I think we do a pretty good job of talking, and I think that that they, you know, I, I think that they they know how hard I've worked and and, you know, really, my husband had to step in there and, and be be supportive also and say, no, go ahead. And he, he would always say, oh, well, that's really interesting. You've got to take that tour. Because, I mean, we added five more tours. You know, we did a lot more things throughout the years. And, we, of course, you've got to do that. So we're all into. He supports you. Every He supports. The children had to support. I had to figure it out. My mother had to help. The that my friends would help me. You know, they'd know that I'd be gone, but then the minute that I'd be home, I'd do more. Mm-hmm. Do you know? And 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 you'll do the same with your kids. You'll maybe they didn't. You're not there for that day, but one day you're going to be on his on his thing and help the help the school, and then he'll they'll be happy. Like like you still should. I think that you try to. A friend of mine one time said, if you do something at the school, don't be in the library. Don't be behind the scenes, do something on the playground or with the kids so that they can be with you. And then they'll remember that, you know, so I always would try to be there wherever I could so that they at least had a memory of me being at the school. Mm-hmm. So you, I, and with our flexibility, I'm sure your flexibility too, you, you work in we wherever make it you work. can. Yeah. We make it work. I love the story that you talked about of when you were on a particular tour and I don't remember which one, but you had, I don't know if it was Bruno or another child in a basket underneath the table. Well, I took everybody <laughs> everywhere. I took them. We have a friend whose name is Ted Balistrieri, and he owns a sardine factory in Monterey, and he um, owns probably half of Monterey. But <laughs> he was he was a president of the National Restaurant Association, and well, Biff was later too. But um, Biff, your husband was one he was dog, also. Yeah. But but he he said he never gave a speech that I didn't have a baby under the table because I would <laughs> bring him with me with under the basket and and they would just go and and I remember especially my first child went to so many golf tournaments my mom would go to the British Open to the wherever they I've got pictures of I I remember Anthony um was at the Ping Golf Company with this amazing man this man named Carson Solheim who invented the rabbit ears of the television set he um Anyways, in the golf industry, he was an amazing, amazing man. And I'd say, I took Anthony out of school and I said, now you be the projector. You do the projector. And so he, he was, <laughs> I don't know, nine years old or something. And he would do the projector and set it up. And then I'd give a speech and then, not a speech, but a, a, a presentation. And and that was a nice day for him. And then there were days, Bruno, <laughs> Bruno was the most, I would have to drive to San Diego. And instead of staying overnight for the, for the San Diego tournament, I would drive back and forth, and it would be a lot better if it was in the carpool lane. So at 5 in the morning, I'd, <laughs> I'd go down the hall, and Biff, Biff, I remember, my husband got in the front of the room where the boys were and said, no, you're not taking anybody. They're going to school today. I said, oh, no, they're not. <laughs> Somebody's going with me in that carpool lane. <laughs> so I'd grab a kid, and he'd go with me in the carpool lane. And Bruno loved it the most. He would. There was this par 3 at this one tournament, and each year he really liked it because he always – thought somebody would hit it in the water and he waited all day to see it. while I was working he was sitting on the third I can see Bruno doing that the part three he was sure somebody would hit it in there and then at the end of the day I said, did anybody hit it in there nobody did but he waited every year for somebody to hit it in there. oh goodness well so we can I, take them with us yeah the kids you can do lots of creative things 
Yeah, that's incredible. I love that. Well, the Daryl Survey has done so much, and I mean, there's so many things that you've done today that are relevant. How do you want to stay relevant going forward?、Mm-hmm. What's your vision? Okay. Well, right now we do. We do.、Um, How many tournaments do you do? Over three hundred. Wow. Over three hundred. But we also do consumer research for、um, in China, Korea, Japan,、um, China, Korea, Japan, Southeast Asia, and Co- well, China, Korea, Japan, Southeast Asia, and then the U.S. And we do all the Japan tour, all the Japan ladies tour. On the Japan tour, when I first, the kids were older,、mm-hmm. and、um, it was nineteen ninety four. I would go to Japan, went over twenty times, and I would leave on Tuesday and come back on Friday、wow. to Japan. Commuted to Japan. Ouch! That's not a. That's, that was that's really hard, hard. Really hard. But we didn't have anybody to do it, and somebody said, "Well, they're going to start another company in Japan."、Mm-hmm. They said, "We're going to start another survey company." I said, "Oh no, you're not."、Mm-hmm. And so. To get it started, that's what it took, and then I love it. We hired、oh, no, you're people.、Not. No, no, I'll make、not. it happen. <laughs> we made it happen, but it was it was going there every Tuesday, and I thought I'd stay there, but I didn't like staying on the weekend. It cost the same amount to come home, so I would just the kids didn't even hardly know where I was. I'd leave on Tuesday,、they、come back Friday morning. They thought you were in San Francisco. Yeah, yeah, they didn't、mm-hmm. care, but but going forward, my we now do China, Korea, Japan. Tournaments also the PGA Tour just started doing tournaments in a lot of those Canada, and、um, what we'd like to do is we would like to、um, maybe open it up to other sports? other sports.、Mm-hmm. We we were just recently looking at、um, well we've looked at we've actually done a tri- triathlon.、Um, we actually are looking at like um, um, maybe sailing or. Or cycling,、sense. or something、yeah. with more components. You have、right? to have components. Anything that has, you can do. Yes. Well, well no tennis. tennis. You can't really because it's just a. Our, our next door neighbor was Jack Kramer, who was a very famous、mm-hmm. tennis player. He, you know, he won in Wimbledon in 1946, and he used to say, "Susan, anything you want with tennis, we can introduce you to." But、um, the problem is, you only have shoes and a racket, and、mm-hmm. you can see it on television. Right. It, You can do. We can do cars. We could do what's inside for cars. What's you have to have a bunch of stuff. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. So,、um, That's what I thought when I when we were talking about it and when、skiing. I was reading it. Yeah, it has to have something that has a lot of components that you、mm-hmm. really have to do the research on to be able to identify. So it、mm-hmm. seems like it almost seems like the perfect decision was to start with golf because there's、mm-hmm. just so many different components,、mm-hmm. right? We also watch television and we write down what kinds of a, every single second logos are on television. Mm-hmm. We've been doing that for like about fifteen years, and and we have data on that. So that's interesting. So you quantify the value of that particular mm-hmm. logo mm-hmm. on, and we can do that for other sports. And we can also, we we can actually show you、um, that if the person's using, if if Callaway's the number one driver, or TaylorMade's number one driver, or Titleist's number one、uh, ball, that it that the consumer. It、uses it translates to purchasing of that particular product. Yes, it translates、product. to that,、mm-hmm. and we can also show you that on television. If you were going to sponsor a TV commercial, possibly you could、um, you could sponsor a player, and we can quantify it for you. Yeah. So that so those are all different avenues. That's and, incredible.、Mm-hmm. That's incredible because like when I'm on TV, I always get emails asking me, so who, you know, that that necklace that you wore, who made that? You know, and that shirt you wore. Who? Yeah. So that that's that's interesting. That's、mm-hmm. really fascinating. I love that. I mean, you used to read. So so now, are you going? I know you report now. Th- it's only a three hour delay. Is it going to get to a point where it's almost live re- reporting? Well, we have thought of that. We've really thought of that. But sometimes we okay when we're on the tee, the. Players, you've got all the players, and you, nobody stands still for us. So we get there. We're, they call us the ghosts, like, like, like the person's teeing off and the person's putting their clubs in and they're concentrating. So we have to get this information without bothering anybody. So I'm looking, and I might get this guy's driver, and I might get this guy's shoes, and I might get this guy's putter, and I might get this guy's wedge, and I try to get it all at once. But sometimes the caddy's got the wedge or the so. If you did it live, then that would really show that I've got to get that wedge when they finish or something. So, it's, it's for us. I don't know、possible. that it's so important. It, it, it's possible, but I don't know that it's so important because 
the big thing is who won the count and who right. won the whatever. So at the end, when all, everybody's teed off, then you do the count. Right. So live wouldn't matter, I don't think, and um, you could do it just for interest, I think. But And our information only goes to manufacturers. It's not like live on television. There's, and there's they another, subscribe to this information, The manufacturers right? do, but see, there's another factor. We're not allowed to say who publish the player's name. That's what I to had the public. read. Yes, so, no, we're not allowed to. So I each of the, I guess, each of the manufacturers mm -hmm. that subscribes to Daryl's survey needs to sign off, right? They need to. But mm -hmm. do you? But do you? You actually do report the player's name and what they're playing with to the manufacturers, but they sign a confidentiality waiver, correct? Yes, they sign a waiver saying that they can't use the player's name without the player's permission. So um, there might be a player, like just recently there was a, there's a player that is wearing a certain rain suit that he doesn't want to give that play, that he works for another company, but he likes this other rain suit, so he doesn't put any logos. And he says, you can give the credit to the count for that rain suit, but you can't use my name. To use the player's name, you really have to pay them. You know, like if you're tailor-made, so if it's a tailor-made guy but he's using a ping wedge, that ping wedge can be in the count and make ping bigger in the count, have a count a number in the count. But that player doesn't want his name with that with that ping, brand right. to advertise. And ping knows that, they say, or Callaway or whatever. Like there's like for example, a Titleist player might sign something that says, I'm I only need to use there's fourteen clubs in a bag. I only need to use ten of them, ten Titleists. But four can be other makes. So Titleist says that's fine, but you still need to put a Titleist head cover. And you, if you're going to, you can't be in an Adams or a Callaway or TaylorMade ad because right. you're, we're under contract with you. So it's all really touchy when there's so many components. Mm -hmm. And um, a player's name is a player's name. And a player has, I don't have a right to, to give that player's name to the public. I, I have no right, right to do course. that. Right, of course. Well, on that note, I mean, wh which one was your favorite tournament? Some fun questions now. Okay. I think that, w well, I enjoy, if I had my druthers of going to either Europe or sometimes the U.S. or whatever, I love going to Asia. Like, I really love going to Asia. So I don't know if there's a specific tournament, but I like, I, I love Japan, I guess maybe because I spent so much time and I really like the Japanese people and I really like... Asia in general. Mm -hmm. I, I like going there. I like going to the temples. I like, I like Asia, as a as a country. As a country to mm -hmm. travel to. As a country, and and as far as a tournament, maybe, I do love the U.S. Open in the sense that it's. Do you know what the U.S. Open is? The U.S. Open, anybody can play. It can be the, the fireman that's a good enough player, and anybody. I always say that's my Rocky tournament. That anybody can be. How fun. The best player, yeah. So I think I think I respect the U.S. Open, and obviously the Masters is one of the most magical places in the world. But. Um, Do you have a favorite player? Oh, there's certain players that I've known for a long, long time. Like I mean, obviously Arnold is everybody's favorite, and. <laughs> And people like Nick Price and Freddie Couples and mine are older, mostly older players. But, but even like the like p people that I really respect are people like like Ricky Fowler. He's mm -hmm. really young and brings a lot to the game. And so those are good people too. Very cool. Well, very cool. Thank you so much, Thank Susan. Thank you, Winnie. Incredible story. I always, I just, I could listen to you talk for forever. But I, I really want to thank Susan for, for you for coming and joining us today. Amazing, incredible information. And not only that, I mean, I think this really inspires us to always look at the magical step forward. Mm -hmm. Always focus on stepping forward. That's what I got today and certainly something I will hold to my heart and encourage my children to do to do as well. So thank you so much for sharing your story with us. Um, this is Winnie's son again and mm -hmm. broadcasting here from TuneIn in Venice Beach. Excited to come here again. And if you want to learn more about me, uh, you can find my profile on LinkedIn under Winnie's son. And of course, website, you can just go to winniesun.com and it tells you all sorts of good stuff. But I encourage you and excited to have you follow me on Twitter because I do all sorts of interesting stuff. I even post pictures on the weekend. So, and that's at Sun Group WP. And most importantly, if you want to learn more about Susan and her journey on the golf course, you can go to their website, which is darylsurvey.com. And with that, until next time, thank you.